Hello, everybody. My name is John Murphy. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Eastern Connecticut Arts Review, a weekly magazine about people, organizations, special events, and news for the arts community across Eastern Connecticut. That's Tallinn, Wyndham, and New London counties. I'm here with you live with Matt, uh, with my co-producer Matt Rupar every Wednesday right here at 5:30. After another arts-related show, Connecticut East this week with Brian Smith. So here on WILI, we have an hour for the arts here every Wednesday, and I'm very happy to be part of that team. We're going to spend the whole show today sharing a good conversation with James Bolano. He's the Director of Economic and Community Development here at the Town of Wyndham. He's been with us for many years. And we're going to have an update today on projects that we previously discussed. There's many, many things happening in, in town here and also up at the North Wyndham area. And we're going to try to find how the arts connects to that community as well, so that we get an idea of how all the small things that we do every day in our arts community, at our local events and guilds, that adds to the economy that helps to draw investment when they see people are active and engaged. So it's a, it's a nice way to connect art and commerce, and that's the area that Jim walks very well. We also have some news uh, to share about some local events coming up. So, James, welcome to the show. It's great to have you back in the studio. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Uh, always happy to be here. So I want to congratulate you, too, on the job change recently. I know you and uh, uh, Yuke Sean Lee is his yep. partner. She's, uh, she's also on the staff. You've changed roles a little bit. But it shows growth in the position, the territory, and the need. And I just wondered, uh, in terms of the new role, even though it overlaps the old one great bit, what do you think are the major things you're looking forward to structurally in the next year? Well, well, remember, just to give a little background, Please. when I started in, uh, in 2015, right. The, the the economic development post had been vacant for about six years. And back in 2009, some of your listeners may remember Ted Montgomery yes. was kind of the director of economic and community development. That office handled that, that whole role. When he left and, and the position vacated, economic development was given over to uh, James Finger, for the most part, the planner, and Matt Vertefe over in zoning. And community development, which was primarily the community development block grant, um, went over to um, Mary DeMarco in Human Services, that in the Home Rehab Program. So, so there was that, that split. When I came in 2015, I took on economic development, and uh, Mary still retained the community, what we'll call the community development portion. But uh, you know, all along, we obviously dabbled within the, the broader frame of community development, and both economic and community development can be defined broadly. But when Mary announced her retirement last year, I started talking to Jim Rivers about uh, Yuki doing, you know, was doing a lot of this stuff anyway, working on a lot of grants for the town especially. And I thought that we should refold that aspect once Mary left back into one department. So that's how it came about. That's how we became economic and community development. Myself staying as a director and Yuki being the, the manager now. Her previous title was kind of an odd mix of grant manager, development right. administrator, and now she's, it, it, it's a more sensible, I think, title for her. Yes, indeed. I had Yuki on uh, a while back. I hope to have her back sometime this yep. year because uh, there's many, many good things happening, and the stories in each area are growing one step at a time. Well, and if you talk to anyone, because, yeah. uh, you know, she handles grants townwide, so the police and the fire um, have benefited from a lot of her grants. The Wyndham Pride program has. Mm -hmm. We even got money for... Um, for the uh, registrar of voters um, d during COVID for a grant there. So she's multifaceted and she multitasks and it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to have her. She's been a great asset to the town. Now, as you look back on the early time when you came, projects were still in the discussion stage after many, many years of delay and there were all kinds of reasons for those delays, but sometimes it built frustration. Uh, and sometimes folks really don't know the complexity to just have an idea and just make it happen. So I guess you came in at a time just before things began to become more visible, right. began to bear fruit. Right. Can you talk about that transition and how you think people are getting to be more positive and less uh, uh, frustrated with the lack of change, even though we all may have the same shared vision? Sure. I mean, I think that's always been the case. You know, coming here, I just heard a lot of the old, the old stories. Yeah. <clears throat> One yeah. of the great old stories that was a point of frustration was the parking garage. That had been authorized when Don Williams was the state senator for here. And that's that, right. You know, that, that predates me. I'm from western Connecticut and had our own 
um, elected officials out there, but Don Williams was not a name known to me, but here, obviously, a household name. Indeed. And um, he first got that authorization in the Bond Commission for a, for a parking garage. And um, I came here, and it was like, well, we tried, and it sat, and it sat. So I really ha- that was a team effort, but that was, that's part of this momentum you're talking about. Um, you know, myself had some relationships with DECD, uh, Susan Johnson and Mae Flexer working in their roles in the state legislature, um, and, um, and Tom DeVivo and the whole town council getting behind it. So, so with that momentum in mind, you know, we got it back on the Bond Commission's radar screen, and we pushed. And I don't know if it was maybe a lack of, maybe some people pushed and not everyone did, but this, this was a, this was a, a full-court press right. by the town to get that um, Bond Commission money um, appropriated. And so, so that's kind of one good example uh, of anything. And, and I think... Um, the rest of it, you know, some of it's fortuitous. I like to think I've had something to do with it. Believe it or not, Jim Rivers' appearance on the scene. You know, Jim is Jim is an action guy, and and Neil was a was a good town manager, but he was more, I think, uh, of a of a quiet manager. He he managed in, you know internally in town hall and took care of business. Jim is much more public, and and Jim knows the players up in Hartford as well, and I think. You know, all of this together with our state representatives, and Brian Smith can now be added to that list, Linda Orange in the past. Uh-huh. And um, it's just everyone kind of, maybe, maybe a, um, you know, a switch flicked or something. But, you know, we still had some opposition. Some, you know, they're naysayers, and that's their right to, to that's naysay. That's part of it. But I think the, the momentum started, and people have got on board. They've seen positive things, and they want to see more positive things. So they're willing to, to get behind us on it. And, you know, I think Jim came to us at a time of another kind of change, which was the transition uh, from the mayor to a town council model with the manager. Right. That was a shift that took a long time, and that wasn't approved by everybody, but it, it, but it's worked. It's stabilized. But that's a different model, right? right? And he came during that transition. And I guess now, with planning, things are more able to move. Now, it's funny how success in one project snowballs. To get that sense, you know, in terms of development... Uh, maybe we have a few minutes today. Some of the major projects everybody knows about, the Hurley building, the, you know, the Hooker and the Hill. Uh, can you give us an update on where they are? And they've all had some COVID delays, of course. Yeah. But what's on the drawing board now? Well, I think, as from Martin Kelly, and Martin Kelly's had some health issues. Apparently he was overseas yeah. on vacation and, and wow. caught a parasite in his foot and actually may have to have some, I don't want to release any HIPAA yeah, information, wow. but may have to have some surgery related to that. So wow. it's put him on the shelf. But, you know, COVID obviously stopped that. Then we had a bit of a delay with the with the SHPO dispute with, with Hooker that right. pushed us almost in, into closer to COVID, and that delayed things. But always in his mind when he got started, the Foster building down down the street right. was the obvious first choice because of its condition. Indeed, and uh, he is in there, and he has started in there. You know, the outside doesn't look great, but it's it's progressing. He's starting to, the work, yeah. to strip down to the original brick, but the inside is actually um, gutted, and uh, he started to do some work inside, which yeah, actually, which can't uh, be seen by the public. Yeah, that building's right near where we are now. That's right. Yeah, that's right. There you go. Stones and, throw. And so, yeah, so and that that's the natural building to yeah. move forward with the forty-seven units, I believe, which will be the first. I think he. He'd like to get that building open by the spring because he wants to start to get college students in there for the 22 uh, semester, fall 22. I know. One of the concepts that's spreading around the downtown projects is uh, multi-use, not just exclusive. So maybe in light of that idea of mixed use, could you talk about some of the other projects in the heart of town and how they're coming along as we move yeah. into the fall? Well, well, remember, even the housing projects require under zoning that the first floor, f- first floor, be dedicated to commercial, commercial slash office. Right. So, so nobody could do right. all enclosed uh, that, and so, so we expect. And, and Martin, I know for a fact because I've, I've I've spoken to some of the people, has has had some conversations with with retail, uh, for the bottom. Right. And I have no doubt that when the Hurley Building, the Murphy Building, the Hurley Building, however you want to characterize it, gets rolling, and, and they've got an infusion of more state money to put that project over the finish line, uh-huh. we're told by the owners that that'll be a, a prime location on the corner of Church and Main. Oh man. For, for that. But but the other thing is this, you know, COVID. 
we, we fared pretty well with COVID. I think I know of about three businesses that have closed during COVID. And, and, and some of them, I don't think we're doing that well. I don't want to, I want to point All right. them out. At the edge, you know. Maybe yeah, at, at the, the edge, edge before right, right, COVID, right. too. Yeah. Um, so, you know, other towns have reported a lot more closures. I mean, when they talk about the restaurant industry, yeah. they talk about hundreds closing statewide. And we really haven't seen that. But if you take a look at the resilience of our community, Taquitos just went out. They decided to, 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 to not make a go of it anymore in that business. And if you notice, there's a sign there that says Faux Delight. We're going to have a Thai restaurant in there very shortly as soon as they get through the approval See, process. There you go. So almost seamless in, in that situation. Yeah. Um, you know, That's the, part of the sustainability. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the other thing is, too, and this goes back to Andrew Goot maybe purchasing his building uh -huh. with Cafe Mantic and now Stone Row. But, you know, Angie Jacques, who I call Jacques, I think it's Andy Jake, some people pronounce it, buying her building for the yoga studio. Um, another building on uh, the Harp, purchased by right. the former renter, now the owner. And the Bliss. And, the yeah, Bliss. And so, so this is, you know, this is a great sign. This is investment in the community. I was a renter. I believe in the, in the town. I'm going to stay here, and I'm prospering here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, put, put my feet down in, in the foundation. That's a great sign. Now, you know, part of the strategy that uh, James mentioned is that when you authorize development for housing, requiring retail is a way to add to the environment beyond just a place to live because they're interconnected. And a lot of businesses might not function the same way without the housing component because people are there. And that's something that took a while for people to get, didn't it? Yeah, well, you right? know, I mean, think about, think about the Forster Building. If you put a deli or a restaurant downstairs, you have 47 units, probably 80 people, uh, as a captive audience yeah. that are going to come down. Gee, I have to go to work. I have to go to school. Yeah. And, oh, I'm going to pick up a bagel. I'm going to get, get an egg on a roll or something like that. Or going to have lunch there. So that's very important. I, I should point out, too, in, in the litany of team players that I mentioned, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission has really been excellent. You know, we, we, when they have public hearings, we do get a little pushback. For the most part, it's supportive. Um, but they have been great. I think they've recognized the town turning the corner successfully on development. And, you know, some Planning and Zoning Commissions are... You know, they are like stop signs <laughs> to, to, to progress. And, and our commission, Paula Stahl being uh, the chair of that commission and, and the other members, and when with Matt Vertifik on is, is the staff liaison to them, they have been uh, extremely important in, in, in this development push. Well, you know, that's happening up in Mansfield with the town's relations with the University of Connecticut right now over uh, a proposed smart farm project that had a mixed reaction in town that was ultimately approved, uh, very debated. Uh, as well as something now between the university and the town about housing, speaking of all things. Mm -hmm. So that process is very sensitive. But do you think now, at least, when people debate pro and con, that there's enough of a process underway that people can participate, and you win some and you lose some? I do. I think that that's I don't right. want to and be cynical. But no, no, not right? at all. Right? I think, and I've always said to that, you know, it's some true. people will come to me and say, oh, I, you know, so-and-so is going to Mansfield, or so-and-so left here, and they're going to Manchester. And I said, well, you know, you know, economic development, I was taught very early on, is just not a zero-sum game. People are going to leave. You know, I mean, my goodness, you know, the restaurant industry alone is so volatile that in, in good times, non-COVID times, you know, 50% close within two years. Business. It's a tough yeah. business. Yeah, the fear so, the rich people leaving Greenwich, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's not a zero-sum game, and you can't no. look at it that way. You yeah. will have some successes. Yeah. And there is sometimes pushback with the type of growth there is. I remember O'Reilly got a lot of, you know, do we need another auto parts store? And dollar stores, out, you know, will get the same pushback. And I say, you know, I, would I rather have something else? Well, sure, I probably would. But, you know, you have a willing purchaser of the property, Probably, pl in, in, depending on the situation, paying about a half million dollars for the property, it's an investing about a yeah. million dollars in yeah. the development, and going to put a, a building that wasn't on, or a piece of land that wasn't on the tax rolls, on the tax rolls. So, you know, can, can I squawk at it too much? Um, well, you know, once you build something, if it's not going to be sustainable, and if the owner can't replicate something else... Right then it's available for someone else who won't have to go through the birthing stage, at right. least at one level. Right. So it's kind of a pass-on. And, and we've right. also done a good balance here. It's hard. You know, the downtown are mom and pop. For, yeah. for I think, 
just in my head for the most part, if not completely. And you know, that's when I came here. The, the, the outskirts, um, the commercial corridors, uh-huh. West Main Street and and North Wyndham, those are national and regional uh, chains, and that's that's appropriate. And uh-huh. and those folks, when they dig in, they stay. Unless there's some, you know, remember Ruby Tuesday went out and Friendly's has gone out. Yep. But those are national trends. Yep. They're not leaving Willimantic right. and Wyndham. They're leaving the Northeast. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're, they're leaving collapse. everywhere. So, yeah. So, I mean, it happens. But when those big, big chains uh, dig in, they tend to stay. Yeah. Now, in case you just joined us, we're having a conversation today with James Bellano, the Director of Economic and Community Development for the Town of Wyndham. And for the last part of our conversation, I want to focus on how this story applies to the arts. Because in our community, we have individual artists, we have guilds, we have all kinds of organizations that are all small, they're precious, they're struggling to become stable themselves, and together they represent an economy. And can you talk in your own way from your experience and what you hear, how the arts in different forms connects to this growth? Uh, it's very important. It's, it's it, it, exceptionally important in a town like Wyndham and a downtown of Willimantic that arts be a part of it because we are a hub. We have a historic downtown. Yeah. And we seek to draw people here in the tourism slash arts slash history slash recreational yeah. area and and that kind of goes under the umbrella of tourism yeah i, I don't know if you know so, kind of state funding thing. yeah yeah i'm i'm chair of the eastern regional tourism board which covers the 41 i think it's 41 might be 42 towns in eastern connecticut mm. and, and that's another conversation yeah yeah we'll have to have that that's huge though. And, and arts are arts yeah. are a part of that so you know tourism isn't just i'm going to the beach or <laughs> a tourism is the shabu stage tourism is the wyndham theater guild Tourism is the Kerry Gallery, yeah. but it's also Willie Brew and Stone Row and and Garibaldi's and the and, Mill Museum and, and the Mill Museum yeah, yeah. and and the Railroad Museum and the Airline Trail. It's yeah. all these things rolled into one, which is why we could have another conversation in the future about our kind of marketing and branding and our television commercials and how we've made it a point to get out there and show that. So so art as a component of tourism um, are extremely important. And, and you, you, you've shown me this map here that yeah. I know Matt Vertefe and Chris McNabeau yeah. are involved in this yeah. walking tour map of, of, of yeah. Willimantic Public Art. It's, yeah. it's, if it's you guys incredible. go to willimanticpublicart.org, willimanticpublicart.org, it, it's a tour of downtown Willimantic. You can print it out, walk around town. It's a map, and it tells you where all this public art is. And on the other side is, you know, who's doing what. It's a great resource for downtown. Well, Jim, I want to thank you for coming here. And I'll certainly look forward to more conversations because all these areas are connecting the dots, everything you're talking about. That went really fast, didn't it? I know. I know. (laughs) Well, thanks again for being here. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. And if you'd like to join us, john at humanartsmedia.com is the email. We'll look forward to seeing you again next Wednesday at 530 for Eastern Connecticut Arts Review. Take care and be well.